Hello and welcome back to the Fall of the Roman Empire. My name is Nick Holmes and this is episode 41 called The Roman Empire Divided. At the end of the last episode, we left Theodosius I dead in Milan on the 17th of January 395 with his two sons, Arcadius and Honorius, his successors in East and West. Although it had always been his carefully nurtured plan to leave the empire to his two sons, his death had occurred much earlier than anyone had expected, and this meant there were two major problems. First, both his sons were too young to rule. Arcadius was 17 and Honorius was only 11. Now, if Arcadius had been an exceptionally gifted young man, then perhaps, at the age of 17, he could have risen to the challenge. But unfortunately for the Romans, neither Honorius nor Arcadius were exceptionally gifted. And although Theodosius had no doubt hoped to train them for the demanding roles they were to inherit, his premature death prevented him from doing this. Consequently, during the end of the 4th century and the beginning of the 5th, Arcadius died in 408, while Honorius lasted until 423, the empire suffered from having two exceptionally weak emperors. Second, the main result of this weak leadership was the increasing division of the empire between East and West. This was because court officials and generals in Milan and Constantinople dominated these weak emperors and became the real power brokers. The problem this created was that they then competed against each other, causing the first real division between East and West. Because of this, historians normally mark the division of the Roman Empire from Theodosius's death in 395. Of course, the division of the empire was an old problem. As you know, ever since the crisis of the 3rd century, it had been increasingly difficult for one emperor to rule the entire empire in the way that the emperors from Augustus to Septimius Severus had done. And the real reason for this is that there were simply too many barbarians attacking the empire in too many places. One emperor couldn't fight on the Rhine, Danube and the Tigris at the same time. To solve the problem, Diocletian had instituted the Tetrarchy, the division of the empire into four separate zones, each with its own emperor or junior emperor. And this worked well during his lifetime, but it was really dependent on his charismatic personality, which meant that everyone accepted he was the senior emperor. And without a truly authoritative emperor like him, This system was never going to be sustainable. And that's exactly what happened, if you recall, after Diocletian's death. Constantine spent most of his life fighting one civil war after another until he'd secured full control of the empire for himself. Thereafter, he divided it between his three sons. And this tripartite division of the empire was different from Diocletian's because it was dynastic, i.e. sharing the empire between members of the same family. And this was the way that the empire operated henceforward for most of the 4th and into the 5th centuries. Indeed, in the 4th century as a whole, there were only 15 years when the empire was ruled by just one man. These were when Constantine ruled alone for the last 13 years of his reign, Julian for less than two years in his reign, and Theodosius for barely five months. Now, the big change from 395 onwards was that the emperors were simply too young, and when they became older, too untalented to rule effectively by themselves. So, in the next few episodes of this podcast, we'll be hearing less about the emperors, Arcadius and Honorius, and more about the men and some women who wielded the real power. And let's begin our cast of characters with the man who would dominate Roman history from Theodosius' death in 395 until his own death in 408. And this was, of course, Stilicho. You might recall in the last episode, we heard how Stilicho was a rising star in Theodosius' army, although we have very few details about the roles he had up until 395. Stilicho's parents were a Vandal father serving in the Roman army and a Roman mother. All we know about his early life is that he joined Theodosius's imperial guard and his main career break came when he married Theodosius's niece, Serena. 
So you may be wondering, how does an ordinary guardsman end up marrying Theodosius's niece? Well, some historians think it was a genuine love match. Serena might have noticed Stilicho, who was no doubt a handsome soldier, when he was on his guard duties around the palace. She fell in love with him, and he probably with her, which is well supported, I think, by the evidence which suggests they were a genuinely devoted couple throughout their lives, with her supporting his career in every way she could. Spoiler alert here, she would also die for him when he fell out of favour, but we're a long way from that happening. So, Serena was the key to Stilicho's early rise to prominence. She introduced him to Theodosius and asked if she could marry him. Now, Theodosius was particularly fond of her, so much so that he'd made her his adopted daughter. And although Stilicho's social rank was far below hers, the astonishing thing is that Theodosius said yes, and they were married in either 383 or 384. So suddenly, this half-vandal became part of the imperial family. And indeed, it wasn't just Serena who liked him. Theodosius was clearly impressed with him as a capable and loyal young soldier who could be useful to him. So when he married Serena, he promoted him to head of the imperial guard and then made him a general. And Stilicho's meteoric rise continued as he remained one of Theodosius's favourites. As I mentioned, we don't know much detail about his appointments in the 10 years between 384 and 394, but we know Theodosius increasingly used him as one of his inner circle of trusted favourites. For example, he was sent as an envoy on the peace mission to Persia, which ended in 387, with a truce that enabled Theodosius to divert troops from the Eastern Front to fight Maximus in the West. Then, in 394, after the Battle of the Frigidus River, came Stilicho's biggest breakthrough, when Theodosius asked him to be the commander-in-chief of the army in the West. This was a massive promotion, and made him one of the most important people in the empire. But things got even better for him when a couple of months later, Theodosius's health deteriorated and he started planning for his succession. In late 394, he made Stilicho parens principum, or principal guardian of the 11-year-old Honorius, the emperor-designate in the West. And finally, Stilicho claimed that just before he died, Theodosius made him guardian of Arcadius in the East as well, thereby basically giving him authority over both the boy emperors. However, this claim remained controversial because there were no witnesses to it, and it was immediately rejected by Arcadius and his court in Constantinople. Indeed, Stilicho's ambition for power in the east as well as the west fractured relations between the two halves of the empire, for Arcadius's praetorian prefect for the east, Rufinus, saw him as a direct threat to his own authority. Rufinus, who I mentioned in the last episode, was, according to all the surviving sources, a particularly nasty piece of work, who had eliminated all his rivals except for one, a eunuch called Eutropius, who had been Theodosius's imperial chamberlain. And we'll be hearing a lot more about Eutropius, who was no pushover. For example, he'd already won an important victory over Rufinus by getting Arcadius to marry a young woman who was a protégé of his called Eudocia. The story goes that Rufinus was planning to get Arcadius to marry his daughter when Eutropius cunningly found and befriended an exceptionally beautiful young woman called Eudocia. He showed a picture of her to Arcadius, who was immediately captivated, and according to the chronicler Zosima, Eutropius managed to deceive Rufinus into thinking that Arcadius was about to marry his daughter when he suddenly announced that he would be marrying Eudocia instead. Eudocia was herself a tough operator and would henceforth hold considerable power over her weak-willed husband and became yet another important political player. 
I will just mention briefly another character who we'll be hearing a lot more about in future episodes, the famous Galla Placidia. She was Theodosius' daughter by his marriage to his second wife. It should be remembered that Honorius and Arcadius were, by contrast, born to Theodosius' first wife. This was the cause of tension between them, which would become yet another destabilising factor in Roman politics. Galla Placidia would go on to play a key role in the politics of the early 5th century Roman Empire, but suffice to say at this moment she was at most seven years old and lived with Stilicho and Serena because she'd already fallen out with her stepbrother Arcadius in Constantinople. Not a good sign, I'm sure you'll agree. We've nearly come to the end of our cast of characters who would dominate Roman politics over the next few years, but I've saved perhaps the best to last, who was, of course, Alaric, king of the Goths. And you know already that he was the man who would sack Rome in 410. So he was, to all intents and purposes, Rome's greatest enemy. But at the time, not everyone regarded him as that. You'll recall that Theodosius had made peace with the Visigoths in 382, as we call them from that date, to distinguish them from the other Goths, called the Ostrogoths. As discussed in previous episodes, the Visigoths were the original tribe of Tervingi who had crossed the Danube in 376, begging for asylum from the Huns. After their victory at Adrianople, they became the first barbarians to carve out their own slice of territory within the Roman Empire. But they weren't Roman citizens. They were armed. And in 395, they decided to revolt. The reason for this was that when the Goths agreed back in 382 to fight as mercenaries for the Romans if requested, Theodosius had rather cunningly used them as his first line of attack against Arbogast's western army in the Battle of the Frigidus River in 394. On that day, they had borne the brunt of the fighting and been effectively defeated by the legionaries of the western army. According to one source, they had suffered 10,000 casualties. This understandably became a source of resentment against the Romans, especially as Theodosius didn't reward their loyalty with a donative or special concessions. Instead, after the Battle of the Frigidus River, he told the Goths to make their way back in the middle of winter to their homes in Lower Moesia along the Middle Danube. Although he rewarded their king, Alaric, with a Roman military title, Comes Rei Militaris, Count of the Military, this simply wasn't enough to pacify either him or his kinsmen. Alaric decided to put pressure on the Romans for more concessions by raising a rebellion in the Balkans. Some historians think that part of his motivation was to make himself more powerful by drawing together all the disparate Gothic tribes, since although he was referred to as King of the Goths long after the event, he was probably actually only King of the Tervingi, who were the Goths, if you remember, who were knocking on the Romans' door for asylum from the Huns back in 376. So, Alaric led his Gothic army towards Constantinople itself. The result was panic, for there was no eastern army to meet the Goths, since it was either in the west with Stilicho, having just fought the Frigidus battle, or had been sent east to confront a Hunnic invasion through the Caucasus. Although the Goths were still no better at siegecraft than they had been when they failed to capture any significant Roman cities after the Battle of Adrianople, and it's extremely unlikely, therefore, that they could have taken Constantinople, Rufinus was so scared that, according to Zosimus, he agreed to meet Alaric and promised that he could ravage Greece unopposed if he left Constantinople. More likely is that he simply bought him off with a payment of gold. Meanwhile, in the west, Stilicho was in command of the remains of both the western and eastern Roman armies that had fought at Frigidus. When he heard of Alaric's rebellion, he was probably both incensed that this former Roman ally had betrayed his oath to serve Rome, as well as alert to an opportunity to claim power for himself in the east by defeating Alaric and saving Constantinople. So, Stilicho marched through Illyria and confronted Alaric in Thessaly. But, 
It was at that very moment, just when he seemed to have Alaric within his grasp, that the Romans scored a massive own goal. For Rufinus persuaded the young Emperor Arcadius to order Stilicho to return the Eastern army to protect Constantinople. Or at least that's the version of events recorded by the Roman chronicler and poet Claudian, who is our main source for this extraordinary decision. Historians have come up with a host of other possible explanations why Arcadius issued this order and why Stilicho complied with it. These range from Stilicho's lack of confidence in his ability to beat Alaric to his wish to keep Arcadius happy in order to persuade him to accept him as guardian of both himself and Honorius. In my view, Claudian's version is the most likely to be true, and Rufinus's fear of Stilicho's potential victory was the real motive. But why then did Stilicho comply with something so obviously not in his best interests? The real reason, I think, is the often overlooked fact that his wife Serena and his children were almost certainly still resident in Constantinople at this time. It would therefore have been easy for Rufinus to hold them hostage if he didn't comply with his wishes. Whatever the true reasons, the result of this Roman rivalry was that Alaric escaped while the Eastern army marched off to Constantinople. But there was then a most unexpected twist to this story. When the Eastern army reached Constantinople, led by its general Gainus, the Emperor Arcadius and the Praetorian prefect Rufinus came out of the city to greet it. Rufinus was normally protected by his Hunnic bodyguard, but given the emperor's presence, he was not allowed this protection. As speeches were being delivered, a group of soldiers surrounded Rufinus and hacked him to death. Suddenly, the political situation in the east was transformed. Rufinus's rival Eutropius quickly stepped into his shoes and assumed power under the auspices of Arcadius, who seems to have accepted this changing of the guard because he was dominated by his new wife Eudocia, who Eutropius had so cleverly got him to marry, as I mentioned earlier. But historians have also come up with a host of other possible explanations. Was this Stilicho's plan all along? Did he allow the return of the Eastern army so that it could assassinate his main rival? Or was it Eutropius who alone instigated it? One of our main sources, Claudian, says that it was the spontaneous anger of the troops against Rufinus for denying them the chance to defeat Alaric. We'll never know the truth for sure, but the main beneficiaries were certainly Eutropius and, to some extent, Stilicho. Indeed, they now cemented an understanding that healed some of the division between East and West. Eutropius was an astute political and military strategist, utterly different from the small-minded Rufinus, who only cared about his own political survival. Eutropius's real worry was the Huns, who were at that moment in Armenia and Mesopotamia, pillaging both Roman and Persian cities. But before striking at them, he wanted to get control of the army, and he spent 396 securing the replacement of the two main generals in the Eastern army, Timasius and Abundantius, with men of his own choosing. This took some time, since he had to organise false allegations of treason against them. Such was the brutal nature of Roman politics. As a gesture of reconciliation with Stilicho, he let him take control of half of Illyria, which, if you recall, had originally been part of the Western Empire, but which had been ceded to the Eastern Empire by Gratian when he ordered Theodosius to deal with the Goths in the Balkans. Its return to the West was a welcome sign of greater unity between the two halves of the Empire. Meanwhile, Stilicho marched his army back to the west to deal with the Rhine frontier, where he led successful attacks against the Franks, securing Roman defences and also raising recruits from the German tribes to augment his Gallic legions. Contemporaries record a shortage of Roman manpower due to the large landowners being unwilling to release peasants for service in the army. And this is an important subject we'll return to in future episodes, since it was yet another contributor to the decline of the Roman army. 
By winning some small-scale victories over the Germans in the West, Stilicho was hoping to boost the Western Army's morale as it was still demoralised from its defeats at the Frigidus Battle and the earlier conflict between Theodosius and Maximus. In addition, Stilicho spent time securing the support of the Roman Senate by giving it more legislative power and working with a prominent senator called Symmachus to appoint mutually acceptable ministers to government posts. So, while Stilicho and Eutropius were consolidating their power, what was Alaric doing? The answer is that he invaded Greece, where he besieged one city after another, although Thebes and Athens, the two biggest cities, were beyond his grasp. However, this was not a totally destructive expedition, since Alaric was really hoping to be given a position in the Roman army. Consequently, it seems the Goths didn't destroy property as much as extort protection money from the Greek population for not destroying property. In this context, Eutropius seems to have regarded Alaric more as a potential ally than as an enemy. And this was why East-West relations again started to deteriorate. For Stilicho certainly did not regard Alaric as a potential ally. Indeed, he was keen to destroy him and solve the Gothic problem once and for all. Although his motivation was probably more about self-promotion than true concern for the future of the Roman Empire. So he started getting ready to strike again at Alaric, and in early 397 he crossed the Adriatic with an army of legionaries and German mercenaries, landing at Corinth in Greece, which was of course part of the Eastern Empire. Did Stilicho ask permission to solve this Gothic problem for the Eastern Empire? Uh, no. And Eutropius didn't take this well. Indeed, he saw it as a play by Stilicho to win power in the east. And he was alarmed when Stilicho came into contact with the Goths and defeated them in a number of small skirmishes. But just as the Goths were retreating and it seemed that a Roman victory was within sight, Eutropius did his best to thwart Stilicho by persuading the Emperor Arcadius to declare him a hostis publicus, or public enemy of the state. In this way, any hope of cooperation between East and West was shattered yet again. And yet again, Alaric took advantage of the divided Roman Empire. With the Eastern army not standing in their way, the Goths simply retreated east out of the grasp of Stilicho's Western legionaries. And Stilicho couldn't pursue them since the Greek cities even closed their gates to his men and deprived them of provisions. Eutropius had ensured Alaric's survival as a buffer to protect him against Stilicho. After a campaign of only some 10 weeks, Stilicho gave up and returned to Italy. Eutropius then effectively made an alliance with Alaric against Stilicho by promoting him to a position within the Roman army as Magister Militum of Illyria. He allowed the Goths to occupy the half of Illyria that still belonged to the Eastern Empire and was right next to the Western Empire. Alaric and his followers settled down to enjoy the benefits of Roman pay as frontier guards. The divided Roman Empire had enabled Alaric, its chief enemy and the man who would eventually sack Rome, not only to survive, but to prosper. And that ends this episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, of course, I'd be delighted for any ratings or reviews in whichever podcast app you use. And next week, we'll continue with the Roman Empire's slide towards destruction. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Hold up. 